be in science track, so I'm going to be talking to start out. Uh, and so I'm, uh, I'll be talking to you guys about um, Wengen's workflows in the, well, longer than two years of data processing in ODT, but I can only remember the last two. So let's get started. So uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk much about Apache ODT, except in my way which is different than I think the other people have talked about. Like, they've given you enough background on ODT. So I'll give you my background. I'll talk to you guys about um, how we initially thought about supporting workflows in ODT. And uh, we called that workflow one. And why that didn't exactly work for us and like what we had to change. Um, or what we had to support in addition to that, which we call Wengen. And then just give you some of the history and status of it, where we're at, and then I'm going to try and break into a demo and uh, wish me luck. So most of you guys in this room know me if I look around, so, but this is like my standard slide, so not everyone knows me. I'm a senior computer scientist in JPL in Pasadena. I teach at USC. I teach classes in uh, search engines and information retrieval uh, at the graduate level and uh, software architectures. Uh, and I'm heavily involved in Apache. So I'm the, an executive officer in the foundation. I'm the treasurer, uh, which doesn't really mean much, <laughs> except it's just a bunch of pressure that kind of sucks. But um, besides that, uh, I'm involved in a number of other projects, some of which you guys have heard about here at ApacheCon. Uh, Nutch, which eventually grew into Hadoop, Lucene and Solar, Tika. Uh, and then I mentor like every project that comes in the incubator now. So if you have an incubator project, I'm probably mentoring it. Um, and that's my son, and he's uber cute, and I love that picture, so. Um, let me give you some uh, history of Apache ODT, my style. So there was the old days, <laughs> the beginning. <laughs> and it started with these three people, one of which is here today, uh, Mr. Crichton, Mr. Dan Crichton, and this guy named Steve Hughes, and uh, this other guy, Sean Kelly, who changes his hair color a lot now, which we really like. And I think this is his latest color because I got it off of Facebook. So I'm not sure if it's different than that. And so what, what they were focused on were kind of two first, I think, the two use cases of ODT that are still really relevant. Um, one of which is information integration. And so information integration to them was there were all these distributed archives throughout um, the US and wherever. And um, they were working on these various projects that involved the fact that they couldn't put data, or they didn't want to muck with the way that data got put into those archives. They had existing processes and ingest things in place, but they wanted to expose the information from those archives. Like, like so one classic example that Dan talks about a lot is the planetary data system, right? It's this federated, you know, distributed set of of nodes broken down by science discipline, like some rings data or some small bodies data, and they're in different places. And then they wanted to like search across it, you know, in a federated way and so forth. Another example is like the work you've heard on the EDRN project, which was very similar and a, a component of that called Ernie, which was sharing um, specimen data in a very similar way across a number of cancer research institutes and yada yada. And there was what I'll call the first generation, Dan and I have broken this down into generations, but I'll call the first generation of the CAS, which you guys will hear about a component of today, which was the first generation data processing system they used for the Palomar, I think, testbed. Um, and uh, you'll hear about that today, which is like the initial foray into data processing when you can mess with the ingest processes and when they didn't have something in place and then you wanted it to still integrate into the ODT system. And then there was the hard man, which all kind of, and, and well, okay, let me go back. So, so a lot of the work was for like from 1999 or 98 when ODT started to like 2003. And that was like, the, I'll call it the golden years of those, types of, of those types of systems and a lot of major contributions that came out then. Hard man came along, Sean Hardman. Um, and that's him drinking some wine right there. And so he, he, um, he came along and he was tasked by Dan to, to do the second generation data processing system, the CAS, to make it better, to make it like 
away from Corba, some of the stuff like Dan was talking about, into RMI and XML RPC, and then we were funded by the, he was funded by the CIO's office uh, to do some of this work because they were interested in, in, in data archiving and maybe, you know, cataloging and, and, and putting metadata for, for some of these repositories around the laboratory. And also, they were really interested in databases at the time, and so they were interested that when they archive things that they would run like processors, or they call them, which effectively were workflows, on the data as it was coming in or, you know, as it was coming out. And so we'll talk about that component, that second generation CAS, you know, when it comes along. So then, so, so Ramirez and I, who's sitting in the back or whatever, like, we're the babies of the group, you know, that have kind of grown up in this group at JPL. Um, you know, I would say really getting heavily into working or, or coming into our own with ODT since like 2005. And, and I'll call what we did the, the third generation or the next generation CAS, the more, better, better one, um, which, which is the stuff that you're going to hear about today um, and has been going on since about 2005 for, um, and I'll talk about why and, and the types of things that we did, which was splitting the CAS up into different components and why we had to do that and like what, what made sense about that. So as far as I'm concerned, that's the history of ODT for what you guys care about, and I'm not gonna talk anything else about ODT. So here's the context. This is what I wanna talk to you about. I'm gonna talk to you about um, our workflow management component, which was part of the third generation of CAS which was one of the components that we split CAS up into when we broke it down into three kind of fundamental services, file management, file and metadata management, metadata extraction, and yada, yada. Workflow processing, um, these are independent services. You don't need one to run the other, but you can combine them together like transformers to do interesting things. Um, uh, and so the workflow was the second one, but the workflow manager, we didn't want it to be like a traditional workflow manager that also understood about resources, like what things to put jobs on, like if it needed to run on a node that had Python, or if it needed to run on something that had an IDL. To us, that was a separate enough problem that we forked that off into its own component. We called that resource manager. And to us, the people that maintain those resource management components are more like sys administrators or people that understand DevOps and the types of things that you need to know, like to profile your resources and know what jobs should run on that stuff. And the people that understand workflow are potentially scientists depending on how interactive they are and how, you know, what type of discovery you're doing and or like data processing people that are running workflows at production and have put it into scale like some of the talks you guys have heard about in the past day or so, you know, for these missions and things like that. So, I also am going to make a point during my talk to also point out all the places that this documentation already exists on our webpage. Uh, so that, you know, if people are interested and, you know, we get a lot of comments that our documentation sucks, I make it myself. So I want to point everybody to where our documentation exists so that if you want to make it better or at least see what's there so that you can make it better or tell us how to make it better, then you can. So that's the URL to where this is. Uh, this is the extension point or kind of, I'll call it, level zero architectural diagram for the workflow manager. These are the only things that you have to care about when you're dealing with that in ODT. There's a, there's a client, I don't expect everybody to read this, but it's a client server architecture. Uh, workflow managers can scale out horizontally by adding more of them. So Roy's hanging around here, so Mr. Dr. Russ, so it follows very much his principles. Um, you know, of scale out. If you need more workflow managers, you add more workflow managers. If you need more clients to connect to the workflow manager, you add more clients to connect to various workflow managers. Clients are transient, they come in and out. Workflow managers themselves may also be transient, uh, but most of the time they're not, you know, they're, they're gonna hang around. Workflow managers retrieves workflow models from a workflow repository here. A workflow repository is a home for workflow models, which effectively are data flow and control flow models. Um, the reason that we have a repository interface for them is that people can store workflows in different ways. Uh, a very easy way, if you're on a laptop a lot like me or on a plane, is uh, in XML, in a file. <laughs> a, very, a very easy way, if most of the ways you're going to be interacting with the workflow model is by building user interfaces on top, is to store that stuff in a database to store the workflow models in a database. You can you know, persist it, you're always interacting it with a GUI, that's a very nice way to store workflow models sometimes. It kind of sucks from the command line though. <laughs> you know, Because anytime you want to add a new task, instead of opening up a file, you have to write a SQL query or do whatever you know, to, to add or you know, modify workflow models. So for us, we saw that people were going to do different things there, so we factored that out into an extension point. We can very easily switch between different ways for persisting and representing the workflow models. 
We have a workflow engine, which basically encapsulates the, the control flow model, really. Um, control and a little bit of data flow for the ways that workflow models themselves are executed and marshaled through their execution. And the engine persists information about workflows to a workflow instance repository, which um, could also be a database. It could be Lucene or Solar. If you want to search those workflow instance repositories and like search them and find you know work workflow stuff later, and uh, it could even be like an in-memory thing if you're just you know if you're running on GPUs and you've got you know tons of memory and you just want to you know put it could be that too. Um, so here's some terminology. Uh, here's how we describe. Uh, or here's when we talk about workflows, this is the vocabulary that we use in ODT. Um, workflows are models of workflows. They are not running workflows. They're not things you know, that execute yet. A workflow has a set of workflow tasks that are associated with it. Um, tasks have a configuration. The way I like to think of it is if you have a command line program um, in Unix uh, and you have a set of environment variables which are more kind of static parameters that you don't change as often, but they might be like the configuration parameters, that's what workflow task configuration is. It's kind of the things that don't change as often, but it's a way to provide information to workflow tasks and to record that. Um, workflow tasks have a workflow task instance. That's the thing that actually implements what it does, if it's a script, if it's a you know, call a web service, whatever. Um, workflow tasks have pre and post conditions. And the pre and post conditions can be implemented in different ways too, so there's workflow condition implement uh, instances that implement their behavior. Uh, and so running versions of workflows are workflow instances in ODT. And really what it is is it's a workflow model, some st state or area in that model that we've gotten to, the current um, wall clock time for the task that we're in, the overall wall clock time for the workflow itself, and other types of state information for it run, being run. Um, and so events that are sent to the workflow manager may kick off one or more workflow instances, uh, you know, for that. Okay, that's some terminology. So that's Raj Bouya. And so I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the beginning, you know, with that in hand, the beginning of workflow in ODT. So let's roll back the clock to 2004. Chris and Paul learn about workflows in their office when they're playing like poker, not at JPL of course, you know, but somewhere else, you know, or online things. They're talking about workflows too, and we're learning about it. And we read a paper by Booyah on the taxonomy of workflow management systems for grid computing. It had like 160 workflow management systems or something. And to date, in my mind, is like the canonical description of everything, you know, so yeah, so read that paper. So we also were reading about workflow patterns. And so there was this nice, very nice workflow pattern site, which used to be, I think, in the Netherlands, and now it's like different and whatever. It's at like workflowpatterns.com. That was also really good. It taught us about branch and bounds and what that meant and, and all of that stuff. So yeah, that's Raj. So the beginning or more. So in the beginning, Paul is more interested in workflows than Chris. And he talks to everybody about workflows and acts like he knows everything and whatever, and Chris doesn't care. And Chris, but then Chris gets hired on this project called OCO, and so I become interested in workflows because of that, because OCO has very complex workflows, and I'll talk to you about this. This is in 2005. Oh no, a mission. So I, I, I was signed up to be the lead process control system developer for, for OCO. And my concern as I started to look at the requirements for OCO, which was running like 10,000 jobs per day, um, which was, you know, pulling in, I think, 100, or no, producing 150 terabytes in like the first three months, which in 2005 was a lot of data, you know, uh, for that. It, 150 terabytes was like our nominal sort of level zero, level one processing, and then it was going to get bigger after that. We had like a science computing facility and people were going to run different algorithms. And, and anyways, it was just going to get really bigger. So I was worried because the existing CAS, and I'll tell you its properties, we felt couldn't support OCO because the existing CAS was monolithic, like it was a single component. Um, it wasn't, in order for it to run, like a database had to be up and running, like to even test it. It was hard to develop on your own or with the resources that we had, which were people that were in disconnected operation on their laptops a lot. It didn't facilitate sort of easy transition. And I have some information about this stuff. So Paul and I brainstormed in that office that we were used to be in about what to do, okay? So based on Booyah's paper and the workflow pattern stuff and whatever, these are like the three main things that we wanted, 
you know, our, our, our new workflow manager that we were designing that eventually became this thing called Workflow One to do. We wanted to model, execute, and monitor groups of one or more workflow tasks. Like that was like the core requirement. And task to task could be a script file, a Java process, some external command, a call to web service, you know, whatever. And we wanted workflow to be represented as graphs which we didn't really have sets of graphs that you know, were supported in the CAS at the time, like the second generation CAS. All of the workflow tasks were defined in a database. And they ran, they only could run if you ingested a file. So you couldn't run them unless you ingested a file. And so, so the use cases on OCO weren't always that we would ingest a file and something that would run. Some of our use cases were, we had an operator that would periodically be told by some science investigator, I need to process everything for this day or set of orbits, or we need to process this for, you know, um, uh, I, I don't know. We, we have a PhD student who's getting, you know, her PhD and, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know, studying spectro uh, spectroscopy and, you know, we need to run these dates for her or whatever. The point is, it wasn't only associated with the file. And so we had to separate that and the triggers and the way that we modeled, you know, workflows, you know, from that association. So the, um, the CAS at the time was able to handle these sequential data pipelines I talked about, but you know, executing these ad hoc ones w was, was more difficult. Um, the, other thing <laughs> the other thing was the database. That was a big problem for us because um, we didn't know what database we were gonna use. I was, I was a, um, a nudge committer at the time that this was happening. I was learning about Lucene, I was learning about solar, and I wanted to use solar. <laughs> or I, I wanted, Solar didn't exist then, Lucene did. I wanted to use Lucene. I was like, why can't we store our metadata in Lucene? Why does it have to go in a database? You know, and because I like this NoSQL flat model as opposed to, you know, and a lot of our metadata could be represented that way as this sort of key multi-valued structure of information uh, and sets of keys and things like that. So we had to, at least in order to make me effective or to use me, I had to break out of that mold uh, or whatever. Um, the graph is important, the workflow patterns. We also wanted to capture data flow. We didn't feel we were doing a very good job of capturing data flow. And what I'm talking about by data flow is I'm talking about this task depends on these outputs from another task. This um, task has this set of static configuration and these set of dynamic properties and things like that. So the way the data flows through the graph and the interdependencies between it on the task. So I'm not talking about control flow, but I'm talking about data. So we didn't feel that we were doing a good job of capturing that. We wanted to represent workflow in XML, not necessarily use an existing XML format. We looked at BPEL and some other stuff at the time, or the predecessor to that, I think, and you know, whatever it was with that one standard too many, I forget what it was. But I looked at it and I was just like doing XML setups and I was just like, I don't like this. I, I don't think anyone's gonna specify a workflow using this. I just, I wasn't gonna do it and I felt that we could do a better way of just simply capturing the things that I was interested in and told you guys about with respect to that vocabulary and the extension point model and so forth. And so we devised our own XML schema for, um, for you know, our, our workflows in ODT and I'm gonna show it to you when I pull up my command line terminal here and, you know, towards the last 15 minutes of the talk. Um, right, so this implied a bunch of things. I'm kind of getting you guys to the extension points where they came from, that we would have workflow repositories which go and fetch the workflow description from, that we would have different workflow executions and engines. We would have different ways to execute workflows. And so the proliferation of all the different workflow engines suggests to us that there's different ways that people use to execute you know, workflows. Like, and there are different systems. There's Pegasus, there's Condor, you know, there's Wings, there's the ODT one, there's all these things. And so even at the time back then there was a lot of workflow you know, formats, or, or I'm sorry, technologies. And so people were also telling us like, hey, things like Sun Gridge Engine were coming out at the time and other stuff. And they're like, why don't you use this? And we're like, oh my God, okay. So, so OCO came and they were like, we're using Gexec. Gexec is this like thing attached to Ganglia that Matt Massey wrote and it's this like multi, um, it's this like parallel execution system that's almost like a workflow in itself. And so we had to figure out how to plug into that too. So anyways, we figured out that people had different execution engines, but we just, we didn't want to pick anyone and we wanted to just build this as an interface so that we can do different, you know, workflow executions. And then we wanted to make sure that our system was associated with events, that events triggered workflows and that file ingestion was simply a single event, but not the only event that could trigger something or whatever. Okay, so I've already kind of said how this was different from the existing one. Um, the other thing, 
uh, that I think was important for us was that just separating dynamic information to a workflow versus static task configuration. So for us, static task configuration would be like the algorithm version. It doesn't change based on per instance runs of that actual you know, workflow or the path to the executable for it and, and things like that. And so we would configure that in our workflow manager as a task configuration, things that on a per run basis don't change. The types of things that change, if you think about a workflow just as a simple analogy to a Linux command line program or a workflow task to a simple analogy as a command line program, the stuff that changes is like the command line arguments. Those are on per run you know, executions of things that you change uh, you know, the, the properties. And so we wanted to have that same notion in our workflow tasks. The ability to pass sort of dynamic metadata or event information when we kick things off and let that be read to and written, uh, read from and written to by all of the tasks in the workflow. So they could change things and they could flag and switch each other and support the data flow that we were talking about. Right, so once you, what do you do when you work on a workflow? You hand it off to a workflow engine, great. Um, so the first version of the workflow engine that we built was this one that was associated with a configurable thread pool. I fell in love with java.util.concurrent when Doug Lay wrote it. I thought it was amazing in thread pool executor, and so to me that was it. I, I thought that, you know, and I'll tell you guys the problems that we have with that later. Not always, but in certain scenarios and use cases, like why that doesn't always work. Um, right, right. So what's the external interface to the system? Our external interface initially, XML RPC was popular in 2005. It's still popular in many ways, and a lot, most of the ODT components still support XML RPC interfaces as a core interface. XML RPC is like a lightweight, um, well, it depends on what you consider lightweight. I mean, it's not like, it, it's XML over HTTP. And the XML describes the methods, the remote procedure call method and, and stuff. The thing I liked about it is it was written, I had things written, clients written to it in like almost every library. Python, Perl, Java, whatever, and we could find a very easy one to use, you know, in Java. Um, nowadays, a lot of our, you know, workflow stuff, and I'll talk about later, we have like REST interfaces built with JAXRS to it and things like that. Right, so how do we put it all together? We put it together the same visual way that I told you. A workflow manager has one or more workflow repositories to obtain abstract workflow descriptions from, one or more workflow engines to execute workflows on, and one or more external interfaces that are those event-based interfaces, okay? So we called this workflow one, okay? And it worked great for OCO. This is the OCO standard, um, standard processing pipeline uh, through our level one B product, which was all of our nominal processing. Um, it wasn't our 10,000 jobs a day, but it was on the order of thousands of jobs per day. Um, or at least many hundreds, I can't remember exactly. But yeah, so it's fairly complex. It had some branch and bounds you know, with respect to it, but the real property that made this really amenable to our first workflow system was its consistent processing, that we could model its processing, what it would do per day. Um, so in our thread pool workflow engine that we originally wrote, we have one thread per entire workflow instance. I thought of the thread as the shepherd, right? You hand a workflow instance off to him and he's the shepherd and he walks through the workflow instance ensuring conditions are met and that things are tagged and that state is updated, but it's his job really, okay? So, so this works really well for routine production pipeline processing, where we know that you know, some X between A and B bounds of jobs per day are gonna run, where A is sort of a good minimal bound on the max threads per JVM, right? Which is totally OS dependent, but you know, a good just nice round number to use in Linux, or Linux is like 256 threads in a single JVM for that, okay? And if you need more, then you add more JVMs. You add more workflow managers running on different JVMs that have their own thread pool, you know, thread pools and things like that. And if you, you know, you just, you scale out that way with respect to that. And B is sort of the maximal number of threads that doesn't bound the JVM for that. So this thread pool, which I'm gonna show you guys an example of right there. It's hard to see, but there's a URL to where I'm gonna show you the example from. I'm gonna pull up this workflow properties. It was based on java.util concurrent. Um, and it's thread pool executor, ex executor class. Okay, so literally to use the thread pool workflow engine in ODT, you define these six properties. Or you don't touch the ones that we've already defined for you. And the ones we've already defined for you give you six threads to play around with so you could run at any one time six workflows you know, out of the box, which for all the examples, you don't care about doing anything more than that. You'll never use six concurrent anyway, so who cares? 
Um, but you can tweak the min pool size, the max pool size, the ways the threads grow, whether or not if you reach your max pool, you start queuing threads up uh, and different queue models for that. Um, the amount of time that you wait in between preconditions, if you don't have an unlimited queue, what's your max queue size before it actually just starts dropping threads if you have new things to execute. So it's fairly configurable. We didn't expose, I would say, 50% of the properties from thread pool executor. You know, we exposed these because we felt they were the most important and that they were the things that we were constantly tweaking, uh, you know, for that. Another thing about Workflow 1 is that branch and bounds in Workflow 1 was supported implicitly. So you could do branch and bounds. And so what you would do is, if, and by branch and bounds, basically what I mean is, is one um, workflow task that splits off into two different sort of workflow tasks branching and then potentially goes off and maybe merges back in the end to a single workflow task or maybe doesn't. But that's the branch and the bounds sort of comes at the end. So the way that you would support that in ODT workflow one is you define sort of more than one workflow that's mapped to an event name. So when you set that event, the branch happens. More, more than one workflow gets kicked off in parallel, right? Um, and what you define is the last, uh, so, so, so your event would map to, say, say you had two things, you wanted to branch off into two workflows. You'd define an event that had two workflow instances or workflow models mapped to it. And you'd add a third if you wanted it to reduce, kind of like the way MapReduce worked at the end. You'd add a third workflow instance, and its job would be to kind of bring it back in and to bounce, to, to reduce back into a single one. And what would happen is all three would get executed in parallel, but the reducer would have a precondition on it to wait for the other two to finish, right? So it was supportable, but it required a bunch of work. All right, okay. So the other thing, uh, so, so I talked a little bit about this. In ODT workflow one, and just in general, our ODT workflow model is that tasks inside of a workflow instance have the shared metadata context. The exact same metadata that we use for file management is used in the ODT workflow manager. Um, and it's this simple key multi-valued model, and I say multi because it's important because it's not single valued and, and so it's really supporting this multi-key NoSQL type of model that the tasks um, within an ODT workflow instance have the ability to read to and write from this. And it's important because they could, sig like task one in this example could signal something to task four, right? You know, task one might set some metadata keys like input files, like what were my input files and what output files did I generate and things like that. And then task four could pick it up later. So long as none of the tasks in between overwrote those keys or did something to it because it is a shared metadata context and, and things like that. So the onus was really on the people um, that were managing or writing the tasks that needed to handle explicitly sort of the data flow passing between them and understand that. So for us, most of the time, since those were ODT developers or whatever, it was easy. It wasn't easy, but it, we had more control over the way that that stuff was modeled. So naming collision was something that we had to be pay attention to in that context. Also, you couldn't really group the keys. The way we grouped keys was implicitly by our key names. We would use like this ghetto underscore format you know, to like delineate in our minds what really were groups. Like we had PCS specific metadata, like, you know, provenance or process control and things like that. What input files? We had like properties or switches to configure the crawler that ran at the end to ingest the files. And we would like say PCS underscore property name, or, which really is implying that it's a group structure. We just didn't fully support that in workflow one. It was supported, but you had to know that it was using this sort of underscore format and yada yada. So enter this guy. So. So not the one on the left, that's my son, again, with his blanket that he chews on still, he's like Linus. The guy on the right, that's Brian Foster. Is that on your right? Yeah, okay, cool. So that's Brian Foster, he's now at Google. He used to work for me uh, for five, four years or something uh, like that. He is like a force-changing person. Brian could rewrite the JVM and has written report parts of the JVM just to get something to work just because he couldn't accept how to use a framework anyways. He's awesome, he's great, but he left and he's at Google now, so curses. So enter him and this mission, right? Which we have people in here from this mission, the parent mission of this, which is the MPOS preparatory project now called Suomi NPP and elements of that. But the element of it that was at JPL that I was involved with, which was this sounder peat for the sounder data for the MPOS preparatory project, which is the next generation polar orbiting satellite, there's sounder data and then this, this test bed project, the, the, the 
NPP project has this notion of peaks, which are algorithm and evaluation test beds, and they had the one for sounder data at JPL. Okay, and so Brian. Brian got put on that project and was doing what I did on OCO for that for me. Okay. So they told Brian this. It was a little different than the OCO use case. They didn't have standard production pipelining in NPP. They were an algorithm, or they were a science computing facility or a science investigator led processing or whatever. It wasn't like it wasn't like OCO where they were going to have nominal processing. They would be asked by scientists periodically or whatever, run this, but like run it with the same or in many cases more jobs per day and data and whatever than OCO. Like, um, here is their use case that blew up workflow one, the impetus, the whole reason for workflow two and this talk and all this stuff is they wanted Brian to submit the next three years of jobs today to the workflow management system. And let the workflow management system manage it for the next three years as files, like jobs that wouldn't complete. Like the files wouldn't arrive for months to complete, but they wanted them all in the system today because they wanted to forget about it. They just, and they still are like in many ways this, you know, they want it, they want the system to just do it all for them. That blew up our thread pool workflow engine and model because it caused many of our threads to hold execution and system resources that they would not use for months. Okay? Um, so we needed a different way for doing it. So I don't know if anyone here works at Twitter, but apparently this is like Trammell who works at Twitter, like his doppelganger, his Dave Woolard, who used to work at JPL in our group. And so Dave Woolard um, was sort of managing Brian Foster on NPP, and so they tried to come up with a way of figuring out how to deal with this how to deal, in, deal with this execution model that was different. And I don't know, most of the people in this room are either worked with NASA or involved with it, but the people that aren't, we, technical solutions don't always work. The best technical architecture doesn't always come out when you tell people something, you know, or whatever. A lot of times the requirements are there and you just gotta do it. So they were like, okay, well to do this, we either need to destroy the current trunk workflow manager because that's the way Brian does things, is he's great, but he just forgets backwards compatibility, wire level compatibility, and whatever, whatever. He just goes and does it. Or we need to make a branch or fork and sigh and do our own thing somewhere else or outside of the context of what we're trying to do with, in ODT because we had several customers of our current trunk workflow manager that we just couldn't get at the time. So it wasn't their fault. People like Parmeras and I didn't have time to fully watch this and many other ODT PMC members and, and stuff like, you know, they weren't vested in the workflow like we were. They didn't understand like w the background that we had and what we were going through and they didn't, they just, they were working on different parts. We had people working on the file manager, the curator, the metadata extractors, the resource manager, whatever. That wasn't their thing. They didn't care about the workflow manager. So the only two people that could do it were overcommitted and we just didn't have time and we had to support existing customers that were using the first one. And so we decided in the end that Brian would go off into a branch and not destroy workflow one um, so that we could keep the users in the trunk happy. And so we punted, okay? This was the NPP pipeline workflow just for the P test bed, just illustrative of it's very similar in complexity to OCO. It wasn't simple, even though they were an algorithm processing test bed. This is merely just, you know, for illustrative purposes. So enter workflow two or Wengen. And so they said, well, heck, we're designing our own fully new component. What should we do? Well, what sucks about workflow one? Well, we can't explicitly model branch and bounds. Okay, so we're gonna explicitly model it. In our workflows, and you'll see this, instead of supporting it in that sort of way where you have an event that kicks off multiple workflows and the policy is stored across different things, in the workflow file, you specify parallel or sequential. And workflows themselves are recursive, so you can have sub-workflows inside that are parallel or sequential, and you can just model the whole thing explicitly. That's ODT 70. Throughout the rest of this talk, I will point you at the Jira issues where you can go look at all of these things, okay? So here's a roadmap for what we did. Another thing was that there were no global level workflow conditions pre or post. And a lot of times, like you want a global level, like you don't even want to start the workflow and get into a set of tasks. There are just things that need to be true before you even do that. ODT 205, okay, we started to work on that, which are global workflow conditions for that. In workflow one, we managed to trick people and get away with the fact that we really only had preconditions. 
There are no true post conditions in workflow one. You can set them up by most of the time by adding tasks afterwards that really act as post conditions, but there are no explicit post conditions in workflow one. There are in workflow two or one gen. That's ODT 502. And as Andrew Hart pointed out to me earlier, you can see the delineation between those Jira issues. That was 432 Jira issues in between. And this was over the course of a couple years that this was happening. Condition timeouts. So I didn't really understand this at first, but I got it in the end. What this was is that sometimes you just want like, it's kind of like the NPP case. Like, like you really want a file to have arrived or you want something to be true, but if you waited 15 days and it's not true yet, you can kind of still run, you know? And it's more approximative than exact. So conditions should have timeouts. ODT 207, okay? I really, I don't know, I get this for reporting purposes, but I really don't get this one, but optional or required conditions. So optional conditions, meaning that if it's not true and it's optional, like if it's not successful but it's optional, go on anyways. And so the only thing I can think of in my mind that this really supports is really facilitating like, I tried something and it wasn't successful so I went on anyways, so more logging and informative checkpointing and things like that. So that's really what it supports. You can define conditions as optional or required for that. ODT 208. Better failure state reporting and checkpointing. Before when conditions failed, you basically just knew a condition failed. And to track down why, you had to be an operator guru or download Splunk and go through log files and do whatever and yada yada. So we store explicit condition failure state messages now. ODT 206. Okay? Yes, there are more improvements, including one I had to track down in the internal JPL Jira, which sucks that I had to go there. But it doesn't suck because by the time you got Apache ODT, it was already included in that from our 0.1 incubating release out of the incubator. But it was workflow metadata keys. Brian and I explicitly supported grouping of metadata keys in that way that I told you actively being able to say, you know, search for all the keys that are in the PCS metadata group and then let's only get you know, the ones and the values associated with that. So we can delineate things without having to specifically require some implied key model or key, you know, structure for that using underscores. And more, workflow lifecycle management. I don't expect you to read this, but basically what we did is we changed the workflow engine to be state-driven execution, as opposed to single thread holding resources and marching through workflow model. We said every workflow processor, the which is really kind of the guy or whatever, not a thread, but the person who's thinking about what state the current workflow instance is in, the states define the next state. The states, we, we inverted the control. There's not this god that's like defining the next state based on what he knows. The states themselves define the next state. We have next states and a processor model that marches through next states and failure states and different ways to march through that state model. So. Um, what this literally means is in tools like PCS stat and PCS ops, more ops UI, as an operator, you see more states and you get more information. Whereas before in, in workflow one, the state model had a you know, limited number of states and if it wasn't in one of those states, you kind of knew sort of what it was doing, but you didn't know everything. There's more states now and there's more reporting and stuff like that and the states control their execution model uh, through that. I don't really get this one, but this was our runner framework that Brian introduced. So the workflow one had facilities to submit jobs to our resource manager. We punted all the really difficult stuff about resource management and everything um, uh, to our resource manager. Well, it was a hack inside of iterative workflow res uh, processor thread where I checked if there was a resource manager URL defined, I would just hit it or submit to resource manager and explicitly explicitly do this. So Brian turned that, he saw that as the workflow manager being able to submit things to different resource or different systems or whatever. And so he created an explicit interface that he called workflow runner to do this. So you could, so Brian at one point had ODT workflow submitting jobs to Hadoop, but it wasn't the way that I would have done it because I would have done it where the resource manager submitted to Hadoop and then the, the, there was a tight binding between the, res the workflow and the resource manager interface like I had thought, but Brian just exposed it in the workflow manager. So anyways, I'm not convinced it's the right way to do it, but I applaud the cleanup of my crappy code by Brian for that. Okay? Sub workflows. Okay? So workflows whose subtasks can be other workflows. Yes, this is mind blowing and recursive. Okay? So, so yes, that, that subtask is really another workflow, right? ODT 211. Okay? That itself can have pre and post conditions and all these other things and, and you know, 
This is my favorite one, I think, from the, the new one, dynamic workflows, ODT 209. The ability to dynamically define based on tasks in our task repository what workflows should run and construct them on the fly from the command line or from Java or from XML or RPC. So do not rely on the fact that the workflow has been previously curated and there's an event map to it to simply define workflows based on sets of tasks on the fly. And then from that, create workflows you know, to do things sort of after that. So here, um, you can see that I've dynamically constructed this workflow, which is really these three tasks that run in sequence uh, you know, for that, based on their IDs of the, as the tasks are defined in the workflow repository. OK? ODT 209. So enough of the marching through the roadmap. How can I use all of this stuff? Brian's code existed inside of the internal JPO PEAT repository, the MPP PEAT repository, <laughs> um, for a long time, from 2008 to 2011 until he left. And before he left for Google, we both realized that we needed to push it to Apache for a couple reasons. A, Brian wanted to still work on ODT and still does from Google. So he's at Google and he's contributing to ODT and it's sanctioned by Chris Debonia and all this other stuff. So Google is paying him 20% of his time to work for us on ODT still. So he wanted to still work on it. The second thing is we wanted other people to work on it. <laughs> you know, and, and we, so we put it out there and it's in a branch. The branch is the last working Pete version. You can see it there at that URL. Now, um, so, so then I spent the last two years since then, from 2011 to now, figuring out what Brian did and selectively and incrementally merging and creating all of those Jira, I, there's more than I walked you through, creating all those Jira issues to merge the incremental pieces into the trunk, bringing Wenjin into the trunk of ODT, our mainline development. And that started with ODT 2.15, which was my god issue to solve everything. And, uh, and so that took me two years, and then Paul Ramirez was helping on that a little bit. Um, and then really recently, ODT 491, which are, we finished all this stuff from ODT 215, and it still didn't work. So ODT 04 shipped with ODT 215 done, which was most of the things, but with a broken workflow manager. Um, so we told everybody with 04, don't use the workflow manager, but if you want to get the other ODT components, like file manager and curator and yada yada, all this other stuff, there's a lot of improvements to that, use those but workflow manager didn't work. Until 05, when I created ODT 491 and did a whole bunch of finish line tasks for the workflow manager of the Wengen. So 05 shipped with a mostly working, and I'll show you guys in a demo today, uh, Wengen workflow manager integrated into the trunk that still works the same way and respects that vocabulary and interfaces that I defined for you guys before. And that's basically what I just talked about there. So in 06, we'll finish this for real, 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 real. Um, so who uses Wengen? So Pete still uses it today. Uh, they use a modified version of Brian's original fork and they're chomping at the bit to use this trunk version that includes more people than Brian who doesn't work for them anymore and really works up in Apache but doesn't work internally at JPL so the Pete people who are still on the internal JPL thing don't get any of our new updates. So they'd like to fix that. The other thing is that we have a big project with the US National Climate Assessment creating a snow and ice climatology for the western US and Alaska, basically running a snow science computing facility. And so I want them, and I'll tell you guys a little bit, you know, I, I think I might just skip telling you guys about that because I'm getting down to 15 minutes and I really just want to show you guys like some demo stuff that's cool. So I think I'll do that. Um, but yeah, they're going to use it. They're, they're going to use the new trunk uh, engine. Talk part two with 15 minutes left. Sorry, it's just not going to work. So. I was, had these grandiose visions. I was just going to walk you guys through this, but I'd rather show you guys a demo. This pretty pictures. And here's the other thing. <laughs> I, I also cooked up like another example that I, yeah, I just, I didn't get fully working, but I'm still going to show you guys Wenjin working in another example. But I took some cool images the other day. I have a telescope. It's a, Dob a Dobsonian telescope. Uh, they bought from my wife a couple years ago, and I have an iPhone 5. And as it turns out, if you're looking at the moon with this telescope, even with the 20 centimeter um, you know, resolution thing, you can get pretty decent pictures of the moon. Uh, and so I was taking some moon images over kind of a two-day period uh, you know, in the hopes that I could prepare some like, massively cool workflow to demonstrate all these like engine features to you or whatever. And I spent the better part of 
well, and these, you know, images have metadata, you know, this is some metadata that comes with them from EXIF and from a bunch of other things, and I was going to, like, use this metadata to, like, make a decision and do something awesome, and then I was going to geocode it, and, you know, I was going to put planetary metadata on it, and I was, and then I found this Huggin thing, you know, and I was going to, like, do something awesome with Huggin, which, like, stitches, like, lunar images together, and I was going to make, like, LMMP, like, all over again, you know, and, um, yeah, I I do, and uh, then I was gonna like figure. Yeah, I, was, you know, I discovered N shape, which is gonna, and so so. Anyways, I, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I started with this, and so my dream of moon images sort of died. I Huggin, which worked last night, and I had N shape working to stitch the images together. Now I'll show you. It gives me like this weird. I can't write to scratch disk out of memory bullcrap exception, and I can't fix it. So whatever. So I'm gonna go do demo now. Um, so let me let me show you guys some of the stuff from uh, uh, that I talked about here. Uh, okay, so this is my virtual machine. I'm running ODT in a virtual machine here. Um, I really wanted to do that. Let's see if I can just mirror my. Let's see if I can just mirror my displays. Uh, show mirroring options in the menu bar. Here we go. Mirror displays. Yeah, because I want to be able to see this too. Okay. So, okay, you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing. Good. All right, cool. So, um, let's see if I can go home. Yeah, come on. Okay, cool. All right, so, so what I've done uh, is, let me make this bigger. Oops. Okay, awesome. Okay, so in user local, which is where I install everything, um, I, in this brand new virtual machine, after getting everything running, started to install some ODT components, uh, including the latest workflow manager 06 snapshot, to illustrate some of these components to you. I've I've grabbed the 06 snapshot and I've created a sim link to it um, here, user local workflow for that. I've installed um, the file manager uh, and uh, PCS services and I'm also running the PCS operator user interface to show you guys what's going on for this. And so what I did separately was I, um, I, I originally I ingested a bunch of these, these moon products uh, into the file manager. So you know I've got all my, my moon products there and it's got some, you know, just some basic metadata for them because I was gonna do, you know, this workflow stuff. Okay. So um, so I did that. Now, one thing I'm just gonna point out is this is the this is the main processing screen. So the ODT operator user interface is where like an operator comes. It's a default web app that we have out of the box that you can just deploy and turn on. It's based on Apache Wicket. And it connects to all of our various services running in the background, like file manager and workflow manager, and it tells you like what's going on when you're processing things related to that. So the first thing I want to point out to you is that normally, um, and I can show you this, normally the amount of states that you see in job processing status here for workflow one consists of the following, uh, the following things. It consists of uh, workflow lifecycle. And open up the workflow lifecycle file. It consists of this. Workflows are queued or created. They either were missing metadata and thus didn't start in the beginning. They were paused. They're submitted to the resource manager. They were started and finished. And then sometimes people extend this by adding CASPG if we're using our algorithm wrapper and its basic states, which is like, you know, staging input files, executing, crawling for files, and things like that. So you can get like a few more states. But the point is, there's a very limited number of states to start out with. Um, in Wengen, you'll, maybe it's hard to see, but the, the thing, maybe I can make this bigger too. Uh, control, shift, yeah. So, so here with, uh, with job processing status, you can see there's no loaded key. Oh, thanks, great. No loaded, queued, blocked, waiting on resources, precondition success, execution complete, unknown, pause, precondition eval, executing, postcondition. Anyways, 
there's a lot more state information that's available to you that you can get access to. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, and so what you do, and, and you know, the other stuff you get from PCS data are like what latest files were ingested and whatever. Okay, so the workflow manager ships with a set of default workflow uh, workflows. It ships with default workflows for workflow one in its uh, you know, format and things like that. And it ships with a set of default workflows in workflow two style, you know, related to that. So, um, so here in my Wengen directory, I have, I have workflows, which are workflow two style workflows. Like actually this is, this granule maps one is um, an NPP workflow and this hello goodbye one is, is that. So anyways, we're, we're looking at these, so why not, um, why not actually look at them? Uh, so we have a tool that's also part of workflow uh, two, and it's called, uh, Weditor. And what it, I've, I've taken the liberty of installing it, and what it does is it actually allows you to browse what's going on and what these workflows look like. And so I'm gonna open the two workspaces here. I'm gonna open the workflow two work, workspace here for these workflows. Uh, and I'm gonna open that. And okay, so these are, these are the, um, oh, I'm sorry, these are the workflow ones. I, I'm sorry, I opened the wrong one, that's okay. So I'm gonna pick a simple one. So this test workflow is the classic example. When you start the workflow manager in ODT, we tell you, oh, one classic example, to or when you install it, one classic example is run the workflow, send the event test to it, and what it does is it runs these two task workflows, one that says hello world, and then one that says goodbye world, and it prints your name when it does it. So this is a simple, you know, hello, goodbye world. But one thing to notice is that in workflow two here, it's actually read the workflow one style policy files and workflow information because we wrote it all to be backwards compatible and to work with trunk and everything. It's figured out that this is a sequential workflow. And if I were to save this now, it would save it in workflow two policy format, put sequential around it and then automatically not have the implicit sort of control flow or data flow and have the explicit kind and put that there. So, so that's kind of neat. So, so, and I'm gonna run this workflow for you here in, in a second and show you the difference between running it on workflow one and workflow two and then I'll wrap up. Um, so let me show you now a workflow two style workflow, which lives in here. Okay, so here's a workflow two style one. This is actually that same workflow that I showed you earlier for the NPP Pete. That, that Brian constructed uh, to use that, um, that I had the diagram of sort of earlier in my slides, uh, this one. This one, yeah. So, it's just represented like this. And so right now, this Weditor tool in Trunk, you can use to kind of explore workflows and to actually, it's a, we use it as a conversion tool to convert workflow one workflows to workflow two sometimes and also to read them and just explore visually like what's there. Uh, we also have the capability to do that here from, um, uh, from our, our workflow monitor. I've run 10 tasks or 10 workflows here in Wengen style that I'm gonna blow away and I'm gonna rerun for you right now just to show you that you know it's legit. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so we also have the capability here to view kind of a very, you know, ghetto could be better. It used to be like aligned and whatever, but way to view a workflow as well. And, and Rishi, if I don't see Rishi, or there he is, Rishi fixed that and made this look better or whatever too, but we can also look at it this way. So you can look at it either from this or from the editor. Okay, so, so yeah, so, so that's the way it's running. So let me show you guys. Okay. Workflow. So workflow manager, recall I had said it had a workflow instance repository. That's where it stores all the actual instance information of what's going on from the workflow. If I were to blow this away right now, just say remove it, it's, um, it's gonna complain at me because it's trying to read that. So I'm gonna stop it. Oops, I'm in the wrong directory. Uh, stop. Okay, cool. So now it's not going to complain at me anymore, and it's actually going to recreate that. That's being stored in Lucene right now, so it's also searchable, and you know all the workflow information after that, you can search it. 
So one thing I want to point out to you guys is that right now, inside of my traditional, and sorry, I'm assuming you know something about ODT configuration. I don't have time to tell you. I want to point out a couple things that I've changed. So here I'm using the prioritized queue-based workflow engine factory. That's Wengine. And the difference between that is that normally we ship with our thread pool workflow engine factory turned on, which is workflow one. So if you want to use workflow two, you change it to the prioritized queue-based one. OK? That's one step. You'll notice I can mix and match my repositories, too. I'm using really the workflow one style repository to read workflows in and read their models. Um, I could, if you want to use the work, the Wengine one that understands the parallel and sequential, you have to change it to packaged workflow repository to use that package workflow repository factory. And all of this stuff that I'm telling you um, right now is um, is actually um, it's it's uh, odt.apache.org. Let's see if I'm connected to the internet. I am. It's actually on our wiki as well, uh, and I'll show you where. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's here under Workflow 2 Quick Start Guide. And this is going to tell you which properties to change and, and things like that to get started. Oh, God, I can't even read that. Yeah. So it's going to tell you, you know, which properties to change, and it's going to tell you the same stuff, you know, what you can use and, and all of that to use, to use uh, Workflow 2. And so you notice, but you can mix and match, which is awesome. Integrating it into the trunk. Brian's thing didn't support this mixing and matching and backwards compatibility. If you look at the Wengine branch right now, it doesn't support this because they built an entirely new component. Our goal was to support this in current workflow trunk, you know, for that. OK, so, so we're, we're doing that. There's a couple other properties you have to set, like which runner you're using. Remember I said there's a runner framework? So a lot of this stuff is set for default for you. We also have a task querier and some other stuff. Don't touch those. Just leave that alone. That still works. Um, and then this lifecycle thing is new uh, in, in workflow, too. So setting this workflow lifecycle is really important you know, now, too. So you need to set this. OK, so let's say you did set it. And great. And so I blew away the workflow repository just to prove to you. So we have no workflow instances anymore. And I'm going to start the workflow manager back up. And to prove to you that we have no workflow instances, I'm going to go here to the PCS stat page. And then we're going to see, oh, look, there's nothing. There's nothing that's ran. And there's nothing that's been successful. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm now going to run a workflow one, that hello, goodbye one. Uh, workflow on workflow two um, from the command line. If I can find my prior uh, thing for that. Okay, yeah. And so to run hello goodbye, you send the event test to it. And test is mapped to the hello goodbye workflow. And so I'm going to run it here using the same workflow one style client. And then we're going to pop into the monitor real quick. And we're going to see, oh, things are happening. And uh, let's, you know, just refresh it. And because it's so small, uh, it, it executed really uh, quickly. Let me point something out here, though. Five things ran. Weird, right? Like, I, you know, it really should have only run a workflow that had two tasks, right? Because it was just hello, goodbye, a single sequential workflow that had that. What workflow two does is it unravels everything <coughs> into a workflow. So, so as so happens that each one of those tasks included a condition in it. So conditions actually run <clears throat> as workflows. So conditions in workflow two can be separated. The actual pre and post conditions can be run as separate tasks and executed on different resources, because some conditions are more expensive than others, and they cost us computational resources, and this, that, and the other. And so you see the master workflow here really is test workflow, I believe. Yeah, that's the master one. And uh, oh, let me get back here. These other ones are the unraveled. The task workflow for it, the task precondition workflow, the true condition, the goodbye world task, and then the actual precondition for that, the true condition for that. So it unraveled them. Okay? So now I'm going to illustrate to you the difference between running this on workflow one and workflow two, and then I'll stop. So what I'm going to do to illustrate to you the difference for doing that, and then I'll run a dynamic workflow if we have time. Because um, I love dynamic workflows. It's awesome. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going uh, to comment this out, and I'm going to say workflow engine factory equals org Apache. Don't ask me how I know this. Kaz workflow engine thread pool workflow engine factory. 
and I can type fast, but I make mistakes. Um, OK. So then what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to blow away the repository, and it's going to bitch at me. Well, not in this window, probably in another one. Um, and say, yeah, there. There we go. And say, oh, I was trying to read from that. So anyways. So now uh, I'm going to start the workflow manager back up. And right, so no resource manager URL provided. Great, so we saw some different output immediately, which was good. And again, just to prove to you that you know we really did start it, you know, back up, you know, here we're um, we're going to uh, yeah, um, I'm going to have to hack this. I just realized, but that's okay. We're going to now run. And not that one, not that one, not that one, not that one, not that one. I think it was this one. Let's see. Is this the one I have my client in? I can always just type it by hand if I have to. Yeah, maybe I'm going to have to type it by hand. All right. So now we'll run that same test workflow on workflow one. Operation send event, event name, test. OK, uh, and so. It ran, and I think if I click here, it's going to show us nothing. But if I say all, it's going to show it to us. Uh, it's finished. Don't worry about the progress meter. There's something we agree with that. But you notice it's just one workflow, right? It didn't unravel it into different tasks. It didn't process it that way. It kept it all as a single workflow. It's a single sequential workflow. And uh, I don't have time for dynamic workflows, so you have to believe me. So thanks. I may have time for one question, if anyone has any questions, if you still care. OK. Yeah, please, Yolanda. So this was fantastic and very impressive. Um, I have a question about your motivation to be able to run uh, tasks for three years. Just push a button and let it run for three years. Um, the questions are, how do you debug that? How do you monitor that? And do you need human intervention at some point to steer things or to manage things? Um, so great question. So the PEAT people did definitely want human intervention. They just didn't want human-led direction of the processing campaigns. They wanted the system to do it, but for people to be able to monitor it. Um, and so the best way that we could think is to add more monitoring tools, like some of these tools that I showed today, and also to build tools that I haven't shown that don't even exist yet, but to go mine logs and mine some of the state information from these things. And some of those things are still being built, and some of them like haven't been contributed back, and some of them just don't exist yet. But the more that we can add those types of tools to this and, and, and to have that as part of the framework, I think is good. And so that was two of your questions, and I forget the first one. I, how do you debug it? I think that's part of the, the mining and, and understanding of like, you know, understanding in the control and data flow and whatever, like what processors write things where and like what tasks write things where and like where those, you know, log files the most getaway to do it, but it's also a way that a lot of people still today do that debugging. But then there are better ways, of course, to do it with things like you know, provenance and potentially and, you know, other, other stuff that I haven't thought of yet, but smart people besides me probably will. <laughs> 